Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Hi, Paul. It's great to have you here today. How are you? I'm good, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's good. I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, For people who don't know you, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about you and your background? Yeah, so I'm um, Chief Exec of Elim Housing Association. I've been doing that role for nearly two and a half years now. Um, But I first got involved in housing in 1980, which makes me feel really old, probably because I am really old. Um, Actually campaigning on youth homelessness through a youth council. And that sort of brought me into the sector. In in 1988, 89, I got involved in setting up a youth homeless organisation, which is now one of the biggest youth youth homelessness bodies in the country, uh, 1625 independent people. Um, And I've worked in a variety of housing roles. I've worked for the National Housing Federation. Um, I've worked for two other housing associations apart from ELIM. In the 90s, I was a, a housing committee member of a local authority. Um, and then from 2016 to 2020, I was the cabinet member for housing in Bristol. So a wide so, range of kind of different housing roles there and different mm-hmm. experiences that you bring to this this role that you do. What is it that you do at Elim now? What What is it that Elim do that, you know? Um... Well, Elim is quite an unusual association. I, I've, I've found it pretty much impossible to find anybody like us. Brilliant. Um, in, in that we do... Although we're quite small as an organisation, we've got just over 900 properties. Um, We have a very diverse range of service provision. So about half of our homes are what's called general need social rent housing. Um, Then we've got a a little bit of shared ownership. Um, We also have um, a very small amount of one block of student housing in the centre of Bristol. Um, we provide over 250 uh, bed spaces for people who have experienced homelessness or are threatened with homelessness. So that's that's supported housing uh, where we, we do work. It's not just about providing people somewhere to live. We provide people with support to allow them to go on and uh, um, move into their own sort of long term accommodation. Um, we've started doing specialist supported housing, which is for people with severe learning disabilities stepping down from hospital. Um, and also we are the biggest housing association provider in England of gypsy and traveller sites, um, all, all the way from up here in the South Gloucestershire, all the way down into uh, Devon. Fantastic. And that's obviously what I wanted to talk to you about today was about that provision and, and what you do there, because I think that's that's quite unique, isn't it, for a housing association or are there other housing associations doing that? What you've got is some housing associations that used to be local authority housing departments, when they became housing associations, they also took on the gypsy and traveller provision of the council. Um, so there are a few housing associations with one or two um, sites. E- Elim's route into it is slightly different in that um, it was something that we decided to go into rather than something that we inherited. Um, and we developed a site in North Somerset as our first site. Um, and since then have t- taken on more and more, some which we've built ourselves, uh, some which we um, manage for local authorities. And we, we it's probably going to be our biggest growth area over the next four or five years, Um, probably more than doubling our provision to somewhere in the region of 200 pitches on um, getting on for 20 sites um, in the southwest of England and into South Wales. Wow. Now, you know, I think to start with, one of the things people are always concerned about with this group of individuals is what terminology do we use? Do we, you've, you've already said gypsy and traveller, mm. and is that the correct terminology? I think people are often a bit scared about what words they should use. I, th- I think it's really difficult because um, in, in, a lot, 
in a lot of Europe, the word gypsy is not one that's acceptable and is also not acceptable in some parts of Britain, although the, the gypsy word has become er, sort of owned much more in Britain than in other places, uh, because it is a complete misnomer. It, it dates back to Henry VIII, who, when he uh, basically outlawed um, traveling people, um, he thought that they, and this, this was Roma, who originally came from India, um, he thought that they were from Egypt. So they were the Egyptians, which became over time the gypsies. Oh, um, okay. but, of course, but they're not, they're not from uh, Egypt. As I say, originally the Roma, who are sort of one heritage of that community, uh, started in India and then had a diaspora. Um, across Europe and are now, of course, into uh, the USA as well as, as populations have moved. Then you've got the, other, the, the next largest group is the Irish travellers who aren't related to the Roma at all um, as a group. Um, and obviously there are a lot of Irish travellers in this country. Then there's smaller groups, of Scottish travellers that are sort of related to the Irish travellers. And then there are an, a, a sort of more modern group which don't quite fit with with those sort of long-term traditions of traveling people who are the sort of new age travelers the people who in the sort of 80s and 90s who sort of wanted to get out of the out of the rat race and the normal uh, bits of capitalism and established themselves as a community and are now into their second and third generations of people traveling so completely different groups, really. Yeah. Mm. And really um, interesting that that stigma almost goes back so many hundreds of years, back to Henry VIII's time. Yeah, and and, be, and before then as well. Um, and, you know, it's something that we, that, we, that we still live with now. I mean, in total in the UK, there are somewhere between 200 and 300,000 people with that travelling heritage. Um, and about a quarter of that number still live um, outside of what they would call bricks and mortar. You know, they live either in, you know, in vehicles or park homes or um, or caravans of diff different types. So it's in some respects, it's quite a sizable community. Um, in many respects, it's an unseen community in the sense that when people are living in bricks and mortar they're not necessarily seen as as having that gypsy and traveler heritage which attracts um, a lot of the stigma and the stigma you know like we said it, it goes back such a long way doesn't it and I think that that causes a lot of problems probably for you in in finding sites for people does it yeah it's it's I mean it's local authorities that have got a statutory duty to um, find sites um and you know when i when i look at some of the sites we've got it's almost like somebody said well we need we need a piece of land as far away from anybody else um as we can possibly manage <laughs> um probably sandwiched between a motorway a railway line and a waste disposal site so they're they're often the most you know unsatisfactory um locations although some, some of the ones that we that we manage for local authorities are in sort of quite lovely rural areas quite uh, quite remote uh, but the ones that are closer to the urban areas are often in sort of quite poor quality industrial semi-industrial areas which means that those immediately those communities haven't got easy access to to shops, to jobs, to schools, to health services, and, and those whole range of things that, that people would require. Which increases that deprivation, doesn't it? Dramatically. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the kind of um, accommodation that people are looking for, and you know, I think everyone has an image in their head of what a traveler site looks like. Um, what is it that you provide and you know how what is it that you're looking for when you're finding well you're saying the local authorities find the sites and then mm. you take over the management is that how yeah. it works yeah yeah although we have built you know we have built sites and you know we own some some we lease some we manage so it's mm. it's a sort of uh 
quite complex. I don't know what's going on with my camera today. It's doing some really weird things, isn't it? Sorry. (laughs) Are you an extra in a Doctor Who? uh... I think so. I think I see all I can keep disappearing. It's because Mm. the sun's come out dramatically. Um, (laughs) I said it would, and it would just, I'm just going to move this line here as well. Let's see if that improves things. There we go. Right, I'm back in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a typical a typical pitch on mm. a site is um, that be a large piece of concrete, large enough to park two vehicles. You know, two quite large vehicles um, with hookups for water and electricity, so that those those vehicles can be uh, connected, and then there'll be what we would call an accommodation block, which from the outside world might look like a large shed, but basically it's a kitchen diner plus a bathroom and toilet. Some traveling communities tradition is that they won't use toilets within their vehicles, within their living spaces. So you need to provide those separately. And these aren't communal facilities. These is a separate accommodation block for each uh, pitch right um, okay so there'll be somewhere for them like and it would just be like a you said it looks like a shed would it be like a wooden building or would it no be, it, it no? would be you know it, it, it could be a it could be a brick and block building it could be I mean we are looking at um, it being as ideal for MMC modern methods of construction mm. in terms of being uh, factory built so you know it should meet the same standards as a you know as a house would only it's much smaller because it hasn't got bedrooms in it mm. um and and so by size it it would look like a large shed but actually it's you know it's a it's livable accommodation um and that just gives you know people somewhere else to stay and and obviously you know washing and and toileting facilities Mm. um for their family and and the pitches that you know they'll either be fenced or will have walls between them so it's very clear when one one pitch begins and the next one ends um except we we have got the odd pit uh, the odd site which is just one pitch um so they vary i think our largest one is about 32 our smallest one is about one but they 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 tend to be between about six and fifteen um space for six and 15 families um and quite often you tend to have um families together on you know on the sites so you'll have several people on a site who are related to each other which helps with that sort of community feel and that that that's you know intergenerational support you know between people and from a sort of a tenancy point of view, uh, do people generally move in and stay for quite a while or is, are they quite a transient population within the sites? Within within the sites, most, most people who take a pitch will, it will be effectively, per, you know, permanent, if okay. as permanent as they want it. Um, doesn't mean to say that people won't go, you know, particularly during the summer, might go off travelling. Um, and so their pitch might seem empty um, for a, a few months. But a lot of the people who are on the sites are either older people who aren't traveling anymore or young families with children and they can only travel really during the school holidays um, and because their children are going to school. Mm. Um, but there are there are events across the across the summer which members of that community do like to attend you know, particular fairs and stuff. And which also reminds me, there is a fourth category of traveller, which currently Elin doesn't provide for, but we are looking at a couple of sites at the moment, which is for travelling show people, who are also a category within this, and people who travel around uh, with the fairgrounds. And they've been recognised as a, as a specific group for over 100 years. So they're a separate uh, sort of uh, different group within? Yeah. They, you know, so their sites are specifically for them. They have to have larger pitches to make space for their um, their show, you know, their um, rides or whatever it is. That yeah, some of those trailers are massive, aren't they? Yeah. When you see I mean, them. they fold down quite small, mm. you know, fairly small, but they, they're much bigger than normal 
um, caravan site would be. Mm. But again, some of them are people who've retired from actually working in the in the fairs, um, but still identify as uh, show people and still want to live within that show people community. OK. And are there any other issues with the accommodation that you find? Anything else that's different or anything else? that Because they're very, very different to what a normal housing, normal housing association would manage, aren't they? In that that's normally a building and this is a more of a, you know, it's a very different thing to manage. Yeah. I mean, we, we do have to provide more intensive uh, support and housing management than we would for um, bricks and mortar and, and housing. So for us as an association, for general needs housing, we would probably have one housing officer to about 250, 300 tenancies. For our gypsy and traveller, it's more like one to 50. Right. Um, okay. So it's much more intensive mm. um, service. Um, you know, there, there are often more issues. It's a much more deprived community, much more excluded community. Um, than, than any of the others and, and there does need to be uh, more support given to dealing with some of the, the issues that the community experiences. And you said it's an area that you think is going to be a big growth area for you over the next few years. Yeah, um, yeah there's local authorities have been carrying out their assessments and showing that you know there's a massive lack of provision. I think nationally um, the figures are there are about 3,000 uh, travelling families for which there is nowhere to live. They're technically homeless right. because they've got nowhere to park their vehicles. And of course, there's recently been a change in the law which sort of criminalises uh, their activity. Um, so they're a community which is much more under threat um, at the moment. And so there is a need for a lot more provision than, than currently exists. And we're working with a number of uh, local authorities in the Southwest um, around, you know, trying to provide for more of the people who find themselves traveling and homeless. Wow, it sounds like a really interesting, you know, thing and, and obviously very, very much needed. Is, is there any other advice or anything else you, you think people need to be aware of um, with this? I mean, I think we, along with other associations that are working in this area, last year we published a, a guidebook called Places We Are Proud Of, which you can, you know, you can find on the net, you can find on Elim's website. Oh, if you'd we, send me the link to that, Paul, then we can put yeah. that in the show notes. That would be great. Oh, right, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. So that that covers some of the issues about design and location of, of sites and some of the, you know, good practice around um, supporting that that community um, so we, we are working on how we ensure that even where some of the locations are not great that the accommodation and the provision that we provide um, really is I mean it is a community with high levels of um, unemployment uh, there, there are quite often low levels of educational attainment um, and so that, you know, that brings a whole range of issues and means that we're also working with a wide range of other services uh, to support those people. Uh, also, also, there's need, you know, when you do sites is also making sure there's, there's space for animals. It's a community which really loves its animals, um, whether it's, you know, dogs or chickens or horses. And of course, if people have got horses there aren't many horse-drawn carts anymore um, although there are jigs that are sometimes used for like charity events and the like um, you need to make sure that there's adequate provision for the animals um, associated with the community as well and sometimes you, you know I've talked to people who they've tried living in bricks and mortar and it you know, in terms of their animals, it's not necessarily very, um, doesn't work out well. So no. sometimes they, they want to come on to sites so that there's better provision for their, for their, for their animals, mm. um, as, as well as for their, for their families. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we'll drop your contact details in the show notes so people can get in touch with you if they've got anything else and we'll, we'll put the link to that, that document. Thank you for chatting to me today been really interesting no, it's been a real it's been a real pleasure thank you lisa thank you 